Okay, we're actually ready about now. So this is Jasper Lawler, market analyst here at CMC Markets for our weekly charting analysis webinar. Let me get through these uh, risk warnings on the screen, and then we'll kick things off. So one of the most notable things in the markets at the moment is that uh, you may have seen we saw an absolute plummet in the gold price overnight, slightly off the lows, but still down 1.6% as we price it, um, was down as much as 4% from, uh, from Friday's close. And uh, so there we have it, some pretty extreme price action. Some different theories are going around as to what exactly triggered it, but I feel like the most obvious technical explanation is that we did, on Friday, teeter down and actually make just about a lower low than the November low. And so as of the open in, uh, in China on Monday, we basically had a bunch of sell orders coming in in quite thick and heavy fashion. And um, as you can imagine, quite a few people will uh, be long gold and uh, where would they have their stop loss? Well, looking at this long-term chart in gold, you know, this is going back. You know, these are the, uh, the lows from 2010. You know, this took us to the lowest since Feb 2010, this latest move. And you can see the price has pretty much been well contained um, within this um, sort of here. Here was the, the 1180 lows that we managed to dip down through this year, uh, sorry, at the end of last year and this year. And then this 1140 level was um, was really the other kind of key support for the duration of this year. And so once we once we drop below, that's the November low zoomed out. Uh, and there was obviously some selling pressure coming into the market anyway, and then a, a bunch of augers triggered those triggered those stops um, beneath the market. So anyone who was long would have um, wanted to sell beneath that level, and anyone who was selling short, hoping to capture that downward momentum on a break, also had sell orders down there. So um, <clears throat> that's what uh, that's what would have generated that kind of momentum. And in, in Asia, the uh, liquidity is a bit thin anyway. So that's you know that's why we saw such a a massive move, I believe. Technically, uh, fundamentally, why have we? Well, it's the you know the gold market's the same same real dynamics that we've been dealing with for a while. I think a couple of the major things that have changed is there really has been a shift to a belief that the Fed will be hiking rates, possibly in September. Uh, market belief is, is likely this year, and so based on that latest inflation data on Friday from the U.S., where we saw core prices up by 1.8 percent in the year. Um, coupled with some data that said that um, China, uh, China basically, the government there released some statistics they don't typically release on their gold reserves. Um, they were massive in that China is definitely the, uh, the largest consumer of gold, but they weren't actually quite as big as some had thought. And so that sort of resulting dollar strength because obviously gold is priced in dollars, uh, as well as that inherent sort of demand weakness, a couple of the kind of major triggers for why why gold fell off a cliff like that. <laughs> and um, now we've seen quite a big bounce off the lows. You know, it's, it's difficult in these scenarios to to assess quite whether this is just going to be an entirely false break and move higher. I would suggest, given the extent of this, that that's probably unlikely. You know, we could, we could certainly could. It's not outside the realms of possibility to get a, a run back to uh, to 1,200. But my feeling is that anyone who was long the market now is going to be pretty heavily shaken from this latest move, and uh, a bit fearful about getting long in again. I think the um, the short sellers may win out. And there's an immediate support down here based on this long-term chart down here from the um, the highs here in 2008, as well as that January 2010 low I mentioned, which basically comes in about the 1,045 mark. Uh, but obviously $1,000 an ounce is a lot of, it, it, it should be fairly stiff support. That's that's something that will catch a lot of news headlines when, uh, the headline, when, the, when the price, if the price were to drop down to there. So 
So that's just a bit uh, a bit on gold, but definitely fits in. Even if you're not trading gold, you know the story of, of dollar strength is something that uh, permeates through the other markets as well. It's been a, a trend that we've been dealing particularly with um, in the the last month or so, really. And there was a slight um, slight sort of um, pause during this sort of the the final hours of this Greek debacle, but it seems to have sort of kicked in again now. So we can, uh, yeah, while we're looking at gold, let's just have a quick look at silver as well. Silver didn't manage to take out what was actually quite an extreme reversal on the 1st of, uh, 1st of December, not not long after gold put in its low. And we've, saw, we've seen a, uh, a break past this recent low from the 7th of July, but we're, um, you know, if the day were to close like this, you know, that would be, um, you know, for the more aggressive out there, that would be a potential buying signal because it was a, a false break below and then a strong reversal on the day, potentially triggering a move back up. You know, quite, you know, it's counter trend. So the difficulty with buying a situation like this is quite where does that end? Do you take it right to the high? To me, that'd be risky because it is a downtrend. So strictly speaking, in a downtrend, you see lower peaks. So where would that lower peak be? Perhaps just capped by this down the trend line that we spiked above there? Perhaps based on these closing levels, closing and opening levels, um, it's it's difficult to. Uh, to, to I know obviously you could just choose a sort of price action based exit, uh, but then you could lose a bit of action when you're waiting for that reversal. So tricky to pinpoint your exits there, but a possible possible reversal higher in silver. But again, you know, given what we've seen in gold, do you really want to be long this market even for a small length of time? It's a, it's a risky proposition. Um, I will just while you know I'll keep the theme of commodities going. So, um, seen the question there about pound yen. So, yep, I can uh, I can definitely cover that, Mark. Um, I'll get into maybe I'll drop, drop into currencies following commodities. Um, so I just did an update on the the Brent chart in the chart forum today. So stripped out a couple of moving averages here because I think we've got a fairly obvious downtrend here, also evident in the, the RSI, but a bit of a bounce off the oversold level at 30, taking us back up to these peaks here from March, and I think there is scope for maybe a recovery back up to the, uh, the bottom of this range in and around 61. But the trend to me is, is that we're below the 200-day moving average, uh, we're making a series of lower highs and, and as of this move from uh, the start of July, lower lows. So the assumption would be that either this is the, the top of the recovery or we're getting like an ABC, ABC up to perhaps somewhere in this vicinity before another leg lower. Uh, but we do have, support. to me, the more sort of prominent support you know, you could just be using these closes, but to me, this, these, these lows are kind of the levels that would really need to be substantially tested for, a, a, you know, a complete reversal could be, could be uh, justified. You know, that, that thesis can be reversed, one of which could be, uh, one of which reason could be is this RSA trend line. Sometimes you get these RSI trend lines that will break before the price does, so it can give you an early signal as to reversal in price. Because some of you may have, if you're trading Brent, may have a trend line connecting these highs. To me, that's no longer really valid because it was valid during this period of, um, uh, you know, as the price slanted here. But as it fell off here, you know, it's no longer valid. Really, the, you know, the, the momentum has shifted more kind of down this way, and there's not really a good trend line that kind of covers that. So even if price did bounce up to that line, it does certainly add a bit of weight, and you know, alongside these lows. You know, it's a, it would be an extra, um, extra bit of resistance, but to me that would be a higher high, and also this lower momentum moving in reverse. So it wouldn't be quite as good as if we just had a little drop and then back, where it's more sort of in this downward channel. That's just a, a little bit on um, my understanding of trend lines and how to use them. To me, at this point, when it bounces back, it, it might just be a bit too late for this trend line. That's why. That's why I've got it. 
I cut it out. Just while we're talking about um, Brent, there are the um, you know the ongoing kind of dynamics in all markets uh, are a bit sort of choppy at the moment. You know, the reason we've had a bit of a recovery is that we, we so prices dropped as U.S. production started to pick up and as U.S. oil. Uh, rigs started to increase in numbers, but we've seen a slight reversal of that recently, where actually U.S. inventories had declined again. Um, so I think the gen, you know, the, the stepping away from the weekly data on oil, I think the sort of the understanding that you've got to have here is that even though prices have dropped quite substantially, U.S. production has stabilised. It's not uh, massively increasing, but it's not really decreasing that much in the past few months. And that's putting a bit of a hole in the sort of OPEC, Saudi Arabia plan of driving U.S. producers out of the market. They just haven't quite succeeded in doing that yet. So let's jump straight to uh, pound yen. I've not got it in my watch list. I've got euro yen there, but let's have a little search here only for that. <coughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I follow, like I said, I follow um, Euro Yen a bit more actively, and I think the um, Pound Yen is a good one from the perspective of, obviously, Pound Dollar is a bit sort of non-representative of what's generally happening with the British Pound. Actually, the British Pound has been gaining against a basket of currencies, and that's been particularly so um, in the, as of last week when we heard some comments from the Bank of England Chairman Carney that um, he sees uh, a need for normalising policy around the turn of the year. Slightly strange, strange phraseology, but basically saying that he thinks there should be an interest rate hike, I would assume that either means December of this year or January of next year. Um, so not massively a uh, change, change there, but some in the market were ex expecting a Q2 rate hike from the Bank of England, so that's been pulled in a little bit. And there's been good broad cable strength because really still the UK alongside the US are really the only two nations that look, um, you know, aside from a few emerging market economies, look like in any, in any position to, to raise interest rates. You know, we saw Canada cut interest rates last week, and we saw um, – uh, Europe reiterate the fact they're going to be doing quantitative easing for over and over a year from now. So um, just just that uh, just the pound and the dollar standing head and feet above the rest in terms of monetary policy. Um, purely trend based here, you know, you can see based on this weekly chart that uh, we're in a pretty decent solid uptrend. We've made a higher high, and then uh, coincidentally, this 21 week moving average corresponding with this um, previous peak from the 22nd of Feb, a good confluence of support here and uh, actually, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, not such a surprise to see that um, hammer candlestick. So, you know, if you were really early in, in the game, you know, you're able to pinpoint that confluence and, and buy in at the bottom of the, the, the reversal candlestick. Um, Maybe you've waited for the momentum of the week to carry you high, in which case you, you perhaps bought on a break at that last week's candle to take you up higher last week, and now we're just pushing into the highs, and so obviously the probabilities are sort of slightly skewed out of your favour for buying at the moment. Even though momentum's in your favour, you're, you're starting to buy into resistance, which is generally not a great idea. So your tactics here sort of depend on where you are. If you're neutral on the market, maybe now is not quite the time to be to be buying. But if you're already in the market, then um, you know quite feasibly time to to add to it. On the daily chart, we've got this gap, and that's causing a bit of a fault here. And um, you know, pound pound yen is not unrelated to pound dollar. There's strong correlations there. But um, you had kind of when you're trading pound yen, you have to kind of watch. Um, which is it correlating more with pound uh, dollar yen or pound dollar? Um, it's uh, um, so you know that's that's the kind of key here. And um, pound the pound dollar, as we'll look at in a second, I can show you now, is seemingly a bit of a turning point at 157. 
So we're sort of rolling over here in, in pound dollar, um, quite well off the highs. You know, general market context not quite the same, but in the short term momentum, cable is rolling over. <clears throat> might, my feeling is it might find some support at 155. But then if we flip over to dollar yen, also potentially running into a place where it might roll over. So um, some resistance suggested by both of those, but again, both of those, the, the sort of trend is higher. So it's a matter of are we are we calling a, a turning point here? One of the things from, that I'll be looking out for in this dollar yen chart incidentally is that this was a um, not quite an inside day because it did make a higher high high on Friday, but it's it's a harami pattern. So we're apparently breaking out of that harami pattern to the top side. So a close above here would be a, a bullish signal according to that pattern. But if we get a close back into um, the, the bodies of these previous candlesticks, or even a, you know a lower close, that would be quite a um, you know this upward reversal signal will have been reversed to a, a downward signal bullish to bearish, and that would actually be quite a strong signal that we've seen a, a fake breakout of this pattern, and that we could be headed lower back down to the region of sort of where this low was around 123. So were that to take place in dollar yen, I feel like pound yen uh, may not uh, may not fare too well as well. So I hope that helps. Now we did look at pound, dollar, and dollar yen br briefly there. Let's have a flip over to the, the euro. Now obviously at a pretty interesting spot right here because we're at the uh, the lowest levels since uh, the 27th of May, so with that low there. Broadly speaking, we're still in this kind of choppy range environment, not really an obvious trend taking place here, but you could sort of say that uh, there's, there's not really a decent trend line here, but um, if you do connect these two lows and use that previous low, we're potentially coming into some quite serious support in this area. But again, that's not really a confirmed trend line, and if you were to use this instead, there's more arguably a reversal to a sort of lower trend. My, my, my assumption at the moment is that we're still within range trading environment. Even though this is a bit of downward momentum here, that's fine on the short term, but you probably don't want to be looking at a daily chart for that. That's more like an hourly chart trend to be trading. And I would argue that this, um, this bit of support on the daily chart would suggest now is not a good time for short-term momentum selling because the, there's scope for a, a bounce. But that bounce might not get much further than the, these couple of lows here before we roll over and perhaps come down and, and test this uh, 1660. Uh, again, just referencing RSI, we did have a couple of levels of support here which have broken. So even though price has not quite broken its support, um, RSI has. So that, that could be an indication that um, price is about to follow suit. Now maybe since we just covered some of the major currencies, good to just pull up the economic calendar here and um, let's see what we've got on for this week. There wasn't there, you know, there's not too much today. Um, this is not the main U.S. retail sales data we, we tend to look at. That was released last week. That was dreadful. So that's the you know that's the kind of mixed picture we face. Uh, mixed picture we face with uh, U.S. economic data and the, the scope for a rate hike. You know you've got to follow the trend at the moment. The dollar's strong, so go with that. But um, you know just thinking about it a bit more in depth fundamentally, um, retail sales were, were useless last week. Saw a decline when an uh, increase was expected, um, but inflation, like I said, was was mildly you know kind of in the you know it seems to be heading in the direction of the the. Fed's target. So a few, and obviously jobs data has been um, fairly consistently above 200,000 jobs created, which is, you know, seemingly quite a strong jobs market. So putting that all together, um, you know, the, the the market bias is is hawkish at the moment on the dollar. But like I said, this is not the main data. 
tomorrow. Um, some, you know, for those trading the uh, trading the Aussie, some inflation data coming out. We've got the Bank of England minutes. That's going to be a big deal for cable, and will determine whether this, um, you know, these comments from Carney are going to be completely in conflict with what was discussed at the meeting, or whether, in fact, we might even hear that there were a couple of dissenters and maybe. Um, uh, you know, maybe those couple of dissenters that voted against, uh, you know, voted for a rate hike um, several months ago before oil prices meant a massive bout of deflation and then pulled their dissent back. You know, they may have um, uh, they may have decided to dissent again, and that would be again quite a hawkish signal for cable, and um, could see the pound extend its gains. So that that will be a big event on on Wednesday. And then there's not, you know, there's some ho there's some home price data from the U.S. Uh, obviously, for those trading um, oil, we've got the um, EIA report on Wednesday. Um, we've got the interest rate decision from the from the New Zealand dollar. You know, that's been uh, really weak, the Kiwi dollar, just because of the surprise rate cut last time. And there's a good chance that they're going to cut um, again at this meeting. Something, something we're actually saying by as much as half a percent, which would be quite um, quite extreme. Uh, UK retail sales on uh, on Thursday. Again, I think that's going to be a sort of, you know, that's going to be one of those. Uh, retail sales have been strong for a while now, and it wouldn't be that surprising if uh, they're strong again. You know, so the more the risk there is more to the downside, um, particularly depending on what comes out of the um, the minutes. If the minutes are a bit more dovish than expected, and then retail sales miss, you know, I think we should we could see a bit of a downturn in sentiment towards the pound. And then, really, just going into Friday, it, it's going to be the PMI data, the flash PMI data, that's probably the most important to watch because it gives you your first indication over the month, and that's for for most of Europe, you, uh, uh, most of Europe, and yeah, you, Germany, France, um, also China early in the day, and that Europe-wide number. Uh, as well as the US. So not the most data-heavy week, but a couple of key events there. Okay, I'm going to switch over to um, the indices to round this thing off. Did a few updates today, um, as mentioned uh, here, in the insights here. Let's get to the UK to start with. So just a sort of interesting level um, possibly about to crop up here in this 6860 because we do have these previous two peaks. Um, I don't typically like to try and sell on the third test, particularly when we're above the 200-day moving average, even though it doesn't mean that much when we're in a sort of trading range. Um, but given how far we've come, I think momentum has to be sort of rolling over fairly soon. And, uh, you know, that's a potential area of, of interest for sure. You know, I think um, I think if we hit that 6860, I don't see us rolling back down towards 6400, but there could be a reasonable correction, perhaps down to the um, the peak here at uh, 6650, maybe just back down to the the 200 day. But that hasn't worked particularly. We had sort of a few occasions where it's you know proved of some sort of significance. Clearly, a lot of people have it on their screen. Have a look over at Germany. You know, obviously since um, Greece has been fixed, ha ha. Um, this this indices, uh, this index has been rallying, and so um, you know we had uh, we've had a really pretty strong run since there was those first indications that um, Greece were going to sign on the dotted line, despite the the referendum, and um, we're now making higher highs. It's still a bit of a kind of choppy range environment, and so I think we are still at risk um, of a, a rolling, uh, you know, of a rolling over before we get up to this 11 sort of 920 type vicinity. Because you see how tight that action was there. We're kind of approaching into that range now. There, and then here, 
you know, that was you know, that was quite a tight range. And here you can see that false break higher up to the and then and then the rollover. So there's an there's an example of that kind of um, how the day can eventually close if you get that uh, really extreme bearish example of that um, inside day break. So that ended up being a sort of um, bearish engulfing pattern on the day, and obviously prices rolled over from there. So something like that would be a, an obvious sell signal. We've had the, um, uh, the the breakout here looks similar to that, um, what was that, uh, cable pattern we were looking at here. So inside day, move higher. We'll have to see how far that can carry us. If we get a close above, it's actually quite bullish and could maybe take us that high and beyond. Other thing that I think probably won't be too influential, but I've left it on the chart, is these um, this rising trend line that got broken and then tested a couple of times as we've been consolidating here. Again, worth noting the RSI broken above the resistance here, so that's um, that's a bullish sign, but obviously corresponds with the breaking of this channel and this peak as well. Coming into the uh, final few minutes here, certainly feel free to throw over some last-minute questions. Uh, we're going to jump over to the U.S. Ooh, we've seen some absolute barnstorm earnings from the U.S., notably Netflix and Google in the past few days, uh, both up over 14% in just one day. Uh, not the kind of stuff you see typically. Um, definitely making a few people sit up and think, you know, where their portfolios are or just where they're, you know, what areas of the market they're trading. Because, um, yeah, that's certainly the kind of move that um, can certainly happen in the other direction. But um, encouraging a lot of people to pile into the, the tech stocks that have been doing so well in U.S. markets over the past couple of years. And so that's why... Um, there's renewed sort of a sense of optimism, obviously helped with the global backdrop of um, China and Greece looking a bit more promising. Uh, but that's why we're pushing towards the, the record highs in the S&P. I still think that, consider this, you know, this is a, a range to me, and there's some strong momentum going into it. And um, that strong momentum heading into the top of the range is generally better for uh, a failure than if we just gradually made our way up there. Because if it's gradual, this is kind of counterintuitive. You know, you don't, a lot of people get scared of selling into a large upward move um, because they figure it's going to break. Whereas actually the, these breaks tend to happen when, when the market kind of gradually eases away up. It was gradual safe moves um, that just keep on going. Where if it's a sudden move up there, um, you know, that's when we can suddenly can like just catch fright and drop down. And so this has been this sharp momentum, which has been waning a bit since since last Monday, obviously, is actually quite decent for the chance of this just rolling over in the top of the range. Maybe not perfectly at the high. Um, you know, might dip a bit higher to 2140. Up to 2150, I tend to think the scope for the market just rolling over again. We could use something like that to kind of judge generally where we are in terms of momentum. Um, did just mention the, the tech stocks here, and that's kind of why the NASDAQ is looking pretty promising. Also got a similar line there, worth noting. So perhaps reason to believe that 4700 might, might cap the gains there as well. But certainly an uptrend. Um, so more a scenario of being aware of if you're already long the market than, um, than maybe actively shorting it because um, you know, generally going short the equity markets over the past couple of years has not been a wise move for any, for any long period of time at least. So I believe, uh, yeah, I believe that's it. This, uh, you know, the, the Dow looks very much like the S&P mentioned the chart forum here that we've got a reversal signal in towards the top of the range, but I've judged on these last couple of days, we probably need at least a false break above this line before being able to roll back into the range again. Okay. Hope that was helpful. Good luck with uh, with trading. Uh, good to trading with this week, and I will catch you at the same time next week. Thanks all. Just for all signing out.